Five, four, three, two, one. Pop short. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of the One Puck Short Podcast, episode number 87. And it has been a while. Last time we spoke, P.K. Subban had been traded for Shea Weber. Taylor Hall had been shipped off to New Jersey for Adam Larson. And Stephen Stamkos had decided to stay in Tampa Bay. So, yes, it's been a while. Uh, if you've forgotten who I am, I am your host, Rob McGregor. It's easy to forget. I sometimes forget who I am. So you are forgiven. Uh, Edmonton, as I said, involved in the last episode of the One Puck Short Podcast. They haven't stopped making news since then either. Now, Yakupov's long drawn out departure from Alberta finally came to a close in the last few days. He's traded to St. Louis Blues for the equivalent of some used pucks and a roll of sock tape. Now the well, you know, the third that the Blues gave up may turn into a second if now Yakupov scores twenty goals for St. Louis this season. So I think the Edmonton Oilers will get a second out of this deal because I do believe he will score 20 goals for the Blues. I think a fresh start is going to be good for him, as a few people have alluded to. St. Louis offer him the opportunity to probably have some power play time, which uh, seemed to decrease hand over fist in Edmonton. So, and that's one area of this deal which I think is significant is, yeah, Yakubov didn't have the best time in Edmonton. He didn't do the best he could do after having a pretty reasonable rookie year during that lockout-shortened 2012-13 season. He he didn't build from that like people hoped he might. And that was rough. I think he he took a lot of of hits from the media, from fans, from coaches, from all sorts of people. And there were people saying, you know, he's too small, he's this, he's that. I mean, he's like the same size, he's like the same height as... Crosby and the same weight as Patrick Kane or whatever. You know, it's it just real shitty little things that were just used to barb at the guy. And yeah, as I said, you know, he didn't help himself at times. He didn't put up the numbers that maybe you would hope, even in the situations he was in. But you know, power play teams weren't necessarily the best opportunities for him. They they weren't putting him in a good spot on the power play. He he worked better with guys on uh, who. You were opposite handed to him, so he could be the guy that the trigger man on the opposite post almost. And he didn't often get those chances with Edmonton towards the end. So I think a fresh start is best for him. Obviously, it's uh, added to the, the Peter Chiarelli saga, who's now traded what was it four top five picks? Hall Yakupov this summer, uh, Sagan, of course, Kessel. It's he, like Don Waddell Jr. going on there, and obviously Waddell shipped out a load of people from Atlanta. That came up in the week off the the back of a question Steve Dangle asked on Twitter about whether one GM had ever had quite the record that Chiarelli's had in terms of trading top picks. I think Waddell is the only one who really comes close during his time with the Thrashers. We obviously had guys like Kovalchuk, Heatley, Letton and uh, Patrick Stefan and all, and all this. So, yeah, I, I think this is a good move. I think it's a very low risk, potentially high reward deal for St. Louis. I mean, as I said, I think Jakob will score 20 goals and I think the Blues will look smart because they took a gamble on a guy who's got one year. It was at $2.5 million on his contract and uh, I think he's going to pot them 20 goals this year. So if he gives them 20 goals and 40 points... It's a pretty good deal for a guy on $2.5 million who's cost you, well, it'll be a second by then and what is basically an ECHL player. So happy days there. I mean, I'm still not quite convinced, as others aren't, by the whole trade. Uh, I, You know, you've got to give a little to to get a little and, and all that jazz. But I don't know, was that really the market? Was that really the best they could they could do? And don't be wrong, Larson's a, a, a good NHL D-man. I, I think he... he had a slow start to his NHL career, but he's started to, to find his feet a bit more lately. And I think he is a good NHL D-man. You know, and he signed and sealed until 2021. He's only 23. All this, the entire on his side and all this stuff. And yeah, I just, the, the pressure is going to be crazy on him because he's now the guy they gave up their, their best player for, really, Bar McDavid. And obviously, when McDavid came in last year, that, that changed the dynamic a little bit, which is what made Hall expendable in, in more ways than one. Obviously, they talked about that change of culture in the Oilers dressing room, wanting to make it McDavid's team, yada, yada. So, yeah, I think that's going to put pressure on Larson, though. 
Uh, I think there's going to be expectation there. And the other strange thing they, they did in the wake of the Akupov trade was signing Chris Russell, which has split a lot of people. Uh, one year, $3.1 million. And, you know, if he was the sixth D-man on my team, I wouldn't mind having Chris Russell. I could maybe stretch to fifth, depending on who the top four was. But at $3.1 million, you don't want to be paying that for your sixth D-man. So th- this is where the problem kind of creeps in. I... You know, there's there's the intangibles versus stats argument all the time with Russell. And, you know, I think he's an okay D-man. As I said, if he was number five, I could live with it. Six, probably more so. Uh, but, you know, certainly not uh, more than $3 million. So, But, you know, Euler's going to Euler, and they're bringing Wayne Gretzky in as kind of a, a goodwill or an ambassador, stroke partner, stroke whatever his official title is going to be. They haven't officially announced it yet at the time of recording but that's obviously a, a feel-good story for the Oilers heading in to the new season a new rink they brought in Milan Lucic which again I don't hate because I think putting him with Conor McDavid is uh, going to reap rewards he'll go to the net hard as he does uh, and I just think having a good setup man like McDavid on his line will really help bring Lucic out and, and get him back to being a sort of 20-30 goal guy he was a few years ago and obviously he also adds that physical element that everybody loves and you know hypes up about how he's going to protect new, um you know, obviously protect McDavid uh, and you know all that's kind of true but I, I don't think the Lucic shine is as horrendous as some people have made it out to be but there we go uh, as it's the first show back to help get the wheels turning again I asked you guys a question and then I opened the floor to questions from listeners so the question I asked y'all at home was who won the cup this year simple as that and I had a few responses. Some people maybe are a little more optimistic than others in this mix. So I'll read a few of them out. Uh, Christopher Gill, Gillsy36 on Twitter. Sharks Caps final, Sharks to win. You know, I can maybe see that. The Sharks obviously did pretty well last year. The Caps, their window's still open. I think they could uh, could be in the mix again, or they will be in the mix again. So that, that's not a bad shout from Chris, I don't think. Uh, Philip Armstrong, what we feel, 56. Hearts Heads Flames, I think the... Uh, point here is that phil is a flames fan so we have to wave the little flag of uh, orange right there but head says blackhawks for phil mm, interesting the blackhawks are gonna be an interesting one this year because i mean kane was just stupendous last year off the ice i have no time for that piece of human garbage but on the ice you can't argue with what he did he was he was fantastic on the ice and you can admire the skill um but they did kind of need him and Crawford to be really, really, really frigging good last year, and they still didn't win the division. So are they under pressure this year? I think they're still in the playoffs, and he wouldn't fancy playing Chicago in the playoffs once they're in. But it's interesting. I'm I'm curious to see how they do as as some of their guys are getting older and they're kind of cap-strapped still. Their their wiggle room to bring in young legs and fresh bodies is is tough I mean it's, you know they brought in Brian Campbell on a really cheap deal but he'll be a depth defenseman but they lost Andrew Ladd who again he's an older guy but he could have helped them so interesting I think Chicago a real interesting one uh, Alex Redford Detroit Red Wings for sure surely after 25 straight years in the playoffs we're gonna win it well they have won it a few times I think you're being very optimistic this year Alex and I, I genuinely think this is the year that streak ends I just Cromwell's out at the moment Zetterberg's Basically crocked all the time. Uh, Datsuk's obviously gone. I like Mrazek. I like a few of the other guys like Tatar. They, they're good players. Mrazek's, I think, going to develop into a very good goalie. But there's holes in that lineup right now. And they aren't quite getting the kids coming through that they used to. To fill big holes in the lineup. To fill important roles. So, yeah, I think that's going to be that's going to be a tough one this year. I think the Wings are going to miss out. But a little bit more on that in a bit. And... Via the Facebook page, Pete Lewis, Philadelphia Flyers, just because. And I admire Pete's optimism. I really do. I actually like what the Flyers did at the end of last season, towards the end of last year. They looked a lot better, obviously. Got themselves into the playoffs. I think Dave Hackstall might be a sleeper pick for the Jack Adams this year because once the team kind of got his systems down, they looked much better. I'm still not a huge fan of the Voracek deal, but I think he's a better player. And then he showed last year, he didn't really put up the goals last year that he has done previously. So I think that will improve Claude Giroux. It's good, good to very good. I mean, is he elite? Uh, that's the, the big buzzword. That's the question you ask of all these guys. Is he elite? I think he's very good. I think he'll score again if he gives you 70 to 80 points and Voracek gives you... If he can get back to a sort of 60, 70 point guy, that's, that's a pretty good starting point for the Flyers. I think they'll make the playoffs... 
I guess once you're in, who knows? Especially if if Mason or Neuwirth, if assume they're both still there, of course, uh, catch fire, then then the flies they could upset people. Can they go all the way? You know, you, I can make these funny faces and funny noises, but you know, Carolina and Edmondson played each other in the final a few years ago. So, uh, who else? We got Stephen Ellis, Tampa Bay. Said it two years in a row. It's happening. Uh, I happen to lean to that opinion as well. I think the Bolts this year will. I think they'll be at least a conference finalist, if not a cup finalist. They did really well last year, basically without Stamkos. Well, they were without Stamkos. They also lost Strawman for points. Hedman had a few niggles throughout the year. Uh, I just think they've got a well-rounded team. It's Tyler Johnson missed a bit of time. And I think he's injured over over the summer as well. But yeah, when they get fit and healthy, and Drew Anna's going to play a full year, and he's going to be a little bit older and wiser and he was fantastic in the postseason last year and I, I think all those sort of things coming together and, and mixing into the bag are, are going to be going to be big for Tampa you know to have that team even with the injuries to, doing as well as they did at the end of last year is, is a big deal for, for that team and, and yeah as I say I, I lean towards the same opinion as Steve that they are going to be right in the mix again this year right what else have we got we have John Rousen uh, the Ottawa Senators will go 81-1 one and one and win the Stanley Cup book it. Uh, I'm not sure if John is talking about the actual season or his game on the uh, PlayStation there. But uh, he does ask a serious question on the Sens and what my thoughts are on them. Uh, they had a horrendous special team last year, but 5-on-5, uh, five five, they were pretty decent. He asked whether I thought they were under or overachieved last year. Now, <sighs> you know what? That's I think they were about where they should be and they missed the playoffs by 11 points which sounds a lot but they're or they one two three back you know philadelphia got the second wild card spot then there's boston then the hurricanes and the sense and that's kind of roughly where they are i think Guy Boucher will make them better in their own end i'm a big anderson guy uh, and i just that's kind of roughly where they are they're kind of a a, a bubble team i think if they have a a good streak at the right time again, like they did a couple of years ago, they could squeeze in. Hoffman's a good player. But I think they would maybe hope for a bit more out of Bobby Ryan for the money he's pulling in. Uh, you know, he's their highest paid player, even with for enough in the lineup for a year now. I, I kind of feel like they, they want more out of him, but I say big Hoffman fan. I quite like Mark Stone. They brought in Derek Brassard, who's, who's been around and is a, a good two-way player. Uh, he'll help them in their own end as well. Obviously, Eric Carlson, you know, Eric Carlson is Eric Carlson. It's uh, a perennial Norris Trophy winner right there. So they could. I'm not I'm not hugely high on them in a sense. I, I, as I said, I think they're a bubble team. I think they'll be a bubble team again this year. So they could squeeze in. But, you know, I wouldn't bet my house on it by, by any means. Uh, I, I, yeah, I'm not saying no, but. I'm kind of saying no. <laughs> uh, clantastic. Uh, Pens won the Stanley Cup, helped largely by their speed. Do you see any significant upgrades elsewhere to emulate that? I mean, this is kind of a two-pronged question in, in a sense that the league overall has got faster year on year on year, and that's just a widely accepted kind of fact now. But the other thing you always see every year is teams trying to emulate last year's winner. So, kind of when the Ducks won it with that sort of big horses like Pronger on the back end and Getzlaff and Perry, uh, you know, the teams were like, well, where can we find this big horse to play all these big minutes? And where can we find our Scott Niedermeyer and uh, our Jeski Gare and, and all this sort of stuff? Sorry, throat getting dry. And, uh, and you kind of see that every year. Do we see it again this year? Well, as I said, the, the, the league is getting quicker just as a league. And the other thing the Pens had was the best player in the world, who's currently injured, but you know, it doesn't sound monstrously serious if I risk saying that, but he'll be out for a little bit. I then got probably one of the other top at least 10 players in the world in Malkin, maybe more. They've got one of the best puck-moving defence winning Crystal Tang. They had two goalies they could have gone to who could have done the job. It happens to be Matt Murray, who, who saddled most of the load because Fleur is injured. Murray got the nod and, and just ran with it. And that kind of thing kind of helps the team. Uh, you know, Haglin was a big pickup, and, and Jim Rutherford acknowledged that in a, a Players' Tribune article he did recently. 
and obviously that reflects to the the speed Clandastic was referring to there. But I think it's every team is kind of getting quicker, so they're all trying to emulate that anyway before the Pens had even won the cup. And it's not just that you look at teams like Colorado with all the speed they've got through guys like Duchesne and McKinnon, but you know there's components they are very clearly missing. So yes, in a sense that that I can see it being emulated partly because that's the way the league is going, partly because every team tries to emulate last year's team, or, or a lot of teams try to emulate last year's winner uh, and as kind of uh, habit <laughs> almost. And, and sometimes you just wish teams would find their own identity and, and you know, kind of like the Los Angeles Kings have done. They, they've they found who they are. They play a certain way under Sutter and they've had success doing it. You know, and, and guys like the Cavalier, they got a little bit more out of last year than maybe we'd seen in, in, the previous few seasons, uh, just because their, that system suited him better, that there wasn't the need to be whip it fast, and, and he could play and fit into that system much more easily. So, a question from Philip Armstrong, I mentioned Phil earlier, and his hopes the Flames would win the Cup again. A Flames question: How much of a wizard is Brad Treliving for getting Godro signed to that contract? Uh, Johnny Godro, six years, forty point five million dollar contract, cap hit six. Point seven five million dollars in terms of people on similar money or similar cap hits. I think Alze Kopitar is the only one who can really be called equal to or better or maybe better than uh, Johnny Hockey, as they call him. I, I, it's a very good deal for, for Calgary. I, I don't think there's any question there. That's that's a cracking deal. Uh, they're very close to the cap ceiling. They've got about what just under ten thousand dollars free, which isn't a a huge amount. It was eight point eight thousand two hundred sixty-eight dollars in cap space. So not a lot, but they have got two of their main players locked up in Monaghan and Johnny Gaudreau. Uh, Troy Brower deal may be looking a little bit ropey because of that lack of cap space. But just in general terms, it's it's a good team. Yeah, you know, they they had a good team for the last couple of years. They obviously struggled between the pipes last year in a very tough division in a very tough conference. Uh, but you know, Matt Kachuk's going to get a look. Sam Bennett is starting to develop nicely. The back end is looking pretty solid with Giordano, Hamilton, and TJ Brody back there. I think if Brian Elliott pans out for them, that that could be huge. Uh, he's a UFA next summer. But I think importantly for Elliott, last year at the Blues, he was less insulated than he had been in previous years in St. Louis. And I think that was important because that was always the knock against him was that he's he's insulated by the St. Louis defence. It was like a perfect mix of goaltender and blue line just working nicely in harmony. They did what they needed to do and he mopped up the rest and it worked so nicely. But he was never kind of the guy there. And Jake Allen was always on the horizon. Obviously, Allen's going to be their number one this year. And that's the, almost the long way to dissension for him. But Elliot's got a chance here to show that, yeah, he has matured. He's learned a lot. He's more consistent than me. Maybe he was in, in Ottawa and then Colorado. And it, it's big for them, I think. Even if he is around league average, that Flames team is better. Because that's what they needed last year. It was somebody to give them something around league average uh, to make them more competitive. And in the end... They missed out in the wild card spot by 10 points. They had 77 points to Minnesota's 87. And, you know, it's not necessarily a fair reflection of the way the Flames played when you say, well, there's only two teams worse than them in the West. And it's like, well, yeah, but they couldn't buy a save for love and the money. And th- that hurt them. That really hurt them. You know, they, they scored 231 goals, which is pretty good. I mean, you're looking at just the West, only San Jose scored more goals than the Flames. Uh, oh, no, sorry. Um, Dallas and Chicago as well. I have expanded my screen far enough, but that's still a pretty good going. The fourth highest scoring team in the West. And, you know, Dallas are just freaks when it comes to offense. See, San Jose had a great year. Uh, and, you know, they were only a couple of goals behind Chicago. And that's with the aforementioned Patrick Kane super season, which he had on the ice. So uh, do they get back in? They might. Um, that kind of is a question we'll come to in a minute. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's a great deal. I've, I've kind of spurred off a tangent. That's a, that's a great deal in answer to Phil's question, uh, you know, to get a young man like that locked up for uh, for the long term. And, you know, as I said, they've got several of these guys locked up for, for a number of years now. Gordro is 23 and he's locked up to 2022. Monaghan's 22 years old and he's locked up to 2023. Hamilton's locked up to 2021. Giordano's a bit older, 33 now, but he is tied up until 2022. 
and Brody's locked up till 2020. So you, you know, that's that's a pretty good core to have tied up for the longer term. Uh, Froelich and Brower are also under contract till 2020. I assume Elliot probably will be as well in the near future. So, you know, they're kind of back in there, guys. But I think... Uh, one signing that, that could be huge for them. Maybe it'll only be for one year. It's only a one-year contract. But Christopher Stieg, $950,000. Now, he's slated to play on the first line with Monaghan and Godreau uh, during the season opener. But you know, even if he ends up dropping down to the third line, this is a player who can score you 30 points. You know, If he's a 30-point scorer on the third line for less than a million dollars, that ain't bad going. That's a pretty good deal right there. And he had a PTO with the Oilers. He turned them down to sign with the Flames. And I think that's going to be a beneficial relationship for both teams. And I think Brad Fleming deserves you know, a golf clap for uh, for getting Christopher Stieg in for, for that dollar value, uh, say, just for a year. And, you know, if it really works out, they can talk extension maybe. But he seems to be a guy who kind of bounces from team to team to team. He he is almost the new Lee Stepniak, I think, or the next Lee Stepniak, or you know, Lee Stepniak's cousin at the very least. So, uh, Craig Jones got two questions. So we'll start with the first one. Top rookie point scorer. He's gone for Patrick Lane. I know a lot of people will go for Austin Matthews. It's obvious to see why, and they're both worthy choices. I'm going to go slightly off the board and say, if depending on things pan out in Alberta. I think Jesse Pugliavi could be a dark horse for this. Uh, he fell down the draft board a little bit. At one point, he was the guy pushing Austin Matthews for first. And then he dropped into second. Then he was overtaken by Patrick Lane, partly because Pugliavi got injured. Uh, and then he sort of dropped past Columbus as well, bizarrely. Uh, but the Oilers got him. And if, depending on how they want to line this up, and this is this is the caveat to this, this pick, is depends how the Oilers line up because Lucic McDavid is basically left wing centre. Then who plays right wing? Well, you'd probably say Eberle. But if they want to spread out the experience with the young guys, with the you know the various talents, buddy buddy bar, maybe play Eberle with Drysaitel or Nugent Hopkins, there's a space next to McDavid and Lucic. And if you put Jesse Pugliavi in there, boom, goals, Bonza, great. I, I you know, I, I'm expecting certain things to happen for that to occur, whether they need to have a line jiggle or somebody gets injured or it just doesn't work with Eberle, who seems to be the consensus pick to play on that right wing right now. Uh, I think they should give Puyavi a look. He's had a really good preseason and he's a pretty good player. Uh, it's simple as that. You know, He was in the conversation to go first or for a very good reason. Uh, and had he not got injured, it, yeah, he may have gone second still you know lane had a great finish to the year and gone all the headlines probably rb didn't have because of problems with his health and you know say so he dropped down the board i think the Oilers have got a steal there in the end you know they still ain't got no defense but uh or not sufficiently good defense should i say because they, they have a better defense than they did a few years ago but uh you know he's he's a good player when you put him with someone like Connor mcdavid and, and lucic you yeah it's a cliche and and people may scoff at it and call it intangible or whatever, but you know, having a guy like Lucic running around, even on the four check, makes things happen sometimes. Just because guys mishandle the puck when they get hit or they panic a little bit and try and play it too quick to, to brace themselves for a hit and turn it over and blah, 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 blah. So here we go. So yeah, I'm I'm going to go off boards and say Jesse Pugliavi for the top rookie point scorer and by extension of that, probably the Calder Trophy. Uh, Craig's second question, who makes the playoffs who didn't last year? Now, he's picked Boston, New Jersey, and Winnipeg to replace Detroit, Philadelphia, and Minnesota in the playoffs this year. I had a little think about this one before we went on air, and I mean, this is tough. This is a tough question to answer. I feel like Detroit will drop out of the Atlantic, as I've already said, with I mean, Boston. I've got, I think the Bruins will jump back into that spot. So they'll jump into that third spot behind Florida and Tampa Bay, who I think, again, will be battling it out for the division title. Anyone else? I mean, this is, this is where it starts to get tough. A few people favor the Rangers to drop out. I can understand why they would feel that way, especially if Rick Nash has another off year. But I don't... I don't know if anybody else jumps in from last year. I mean, Carolina are going to be better again. I love their defense. Interesting to see what happens with their goaltending, particularly for Eddie Lack, uh, especially with the, the expansion draft coming up. But I kind of think the only change we'll see is Boston replacing Detroit in the East. Though I do think a couple of teams like Carolina will push. I think Montreal will obviously be a lot closer just for having Carey Price back. But 
I don't know if they're a playoff team again. Might be, possibly. But I, I, knew, I could easily make an argument that Montreal will replace Detroit and Boston will miss out again. Easily make that argument. Uh, but uh, I happen to think it will be Boston replacing Detroit. And you know, Montreal will finish, say, ninth in the conference. I think they'll come close. And uh, obviously, love the last year's complete meltdown, but uh, but that's how I see the East shaking out in the West. Again, this is so tough. I kind of want to lean towards the the idea it'll be the same eight teams, and that's terribly terribly boring. But you know, do Dallas or the Blues or the Blackhawks miss out in the Central? I, I don't think so. I mean, as I mentioned, I think Chicago may take a step back, but I still don't. I don't think they missed the cut at all. And then you've got Anaheim, Los Angeles, and San Jose. I know a few people are down on Anaheim. I can Again, I can understand why on this front. And I think a lot of it depends on how well John Gibson does, because there's not really a safety net there now for him. And you know maybe there was before with, with Anderson and Kudobin. But yeah, it's all on Gibson now. And he hasn't really developed much as a goaltender since he broke into the league. You know, he's got a lot of natural skill, but he hasn't really you know, kind of improved on any of the, the weaker areas or, or just, you know, develops his game. He's still very much the same goaltender we saw break into that Ducks team. So that's that's a big question mark, I think. I know people are looking behind the bench and, and you know, no more Boudreaux there. We've got Carlisle now. And I'm not as down on Carlisle as some are. Uh, I'm interested to see how that works out. I think maybe... As a couple of guys like Getzlaff get older as well, I think not having guys like Lindholm sign is going to be a distraction early in the year, but I still feel like that gets done probably with a trade in there somewhere to accommodate uh, Lindholm Araco under the cap. Cam Fowler's the one, fine. You know, I would like to see Cam Fowler flourish somewhere. I think he's been a bit mercurial at times, but he has shown ability, so yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, th- I still think the Ducks make it. I think there's enough there for them to make the playoffs again this year. And the wild card spots, Nashville and Minnesota last year. I mean, the Preds, <sighs> goaltending is the question mark again for them, but the rest of that team is so good. So good right now. This is their window. I hope they kind of see it in a sense, because if Rene has another bad year, they need to make a decision there. Uh, and I know he's a cult hero in, in Tennessee, but that's that's the one area they really need to look at. And if by you know November, December, he's really not bringing it, they maybe have to have a think. And... There's not a huge amount of goalie trades possible. Ben Bishop is maybe available, depending on how Vasilevsky does. And Flurry or Murray, probably Flurry out of Pittsburgh. I don't think they're going to want to give up Matt Murray at the age he is at. But again, I don't know if they want to give up on him at all. And just to deviate slightly, I know people look at the expansion draft as the the, the big boogeyman on the horizon there. But... When do the teams have to qualify restricted free agents by? Because if, having claimed Mike Condon on waivers this week, if Pittsburgh protect Flurry, they don't qualify Murray before the draft. So by, was it June 17th? I think off the top of my head. But they extend Mike Condon for one year. Condon can be the guy they make available in the draft. So they fulfill their requirement to have one goaltender in the draft. Murray hasn't been qualified, so he's not eligible. Flurry has been protected, and draft comes, goes, all announced on, was it? Seven, no, 21st of June, I think the announcement is. And then on the 22nd of June, they qualify Murray. I'm trying to find come confirmation that they can or can't do that. I mean, last year, the last day restricted free agents could be qualified on was June 27th. In years past, it's been 28th, 26th, 30th, blah, blah, blah. So... What's stopping some teams doing that? What's stopping Boston doing that with Malcolm Zuman? Nothing as far as I can tell. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think Nashville will make that. And Minnesota, I think, will be better under Bruce Boudreaux. Uh, I think having Eric Stahl in there on you know, a pretty friendly deal, really. He's coming off a bad year, but he's an experienced guy. And I think having that extra center will make a difference to them. He's maybe not the marquee number one centre they maybe wanted, but you know, Eric Starr with a point point to prove, you know, three years, ten point five million dollars is a big step down in pay for him. He's only thirty one. He's got a lot of miles on the clock, but he's only thirty one. I say he's got a point to prove. So 
that could be a very shrewd signing for the Wild. If Zach Parise's back is okay, that's big for them as well. The defense is is you know, pretty darn good. And Suda, Spurgeon, Brodine, Dumba, Sc- uh, Scandella, as I said, Devin Dubnik's proven to be a pretty reliable netminder for them. So I kind of feel like they're good enough to make it again. Maybe not good enough to win anything, but I still think they're good enough to make the cut. Uh, I think uh, Arizona, Colorado, Calgary and Winnipeg are all going to be very fun to follow this year, though. Uh, And they'll all be there or thereabouts. And all you need is one of these teams to slip. You know, as I said, I think the same eight will make it, but... For the last few years, the West has been so competitive, and it's kind of spread out a little bit at the end last year. I mean, Minnesota had a five-point gap on on Colorado for the last wild card spot in the end, but that's quite a late sort of pull away, I suppose, for the Wild. I think it's going to be the same. It's going to be teams that are hanging about right to the end or very near to the end, and I think be more than one team pushing near to the end as well. And it, yeah, it's going to be fun. I and mean, some of these teams have got just such young talent that makes them a lot of fun to watch. Um, we'll see. Uh, the Angry Budgie. Team most likely to surprise or upset the establishment. I mentioned them briefly earlier on. I think Carolina will continue to improve. Uh, their blue line is, I think, underrated by a lot of people who don't really pay a lot of attention to the Hurricanes, which, you know, sorry for Canes fans, kind of understandable in a sense. They're not a big, glamorous team, but they've quietly assembled a very good blue line. They've got some good young forwards like Victor Rask. Skinner can still do a job. You know, Jordan Stahl's no mug <laughs> still. He's maybe on more money than his points outputs possibly deserve, but he's still a good player for that team. And, um, you know, Aho coming in as well, potentially. I think they could uh, could do very well this year, and I, I think they're one to look out for, certainly moving into the season. I also have one question come in via email from Mr. Bednard. I'm curious, what is the ceiling for the Buffalo Sabres for this season? Like a few others, I think they'll get better. I think they will move close to the playoffs, but I don't think they will make the playoffs. I think it's a big year for... Sorry, my cat's decided to try and climb on a load of boxes. <laughs> um, I think it's a big year for guys like Robin Lehner because Buffalo needs a goalie. They need to find someone to take that job. He has the potential to be a starting goaltender in the AHL. I think Linus Allmark has got some ability as well. They're both restricted free agents in the summer, so they've got a point to prove if they want a contract. Rista Line in the signs, who I'm not quite as high on as some, I'm not quite as down on as others. I think he's a good defenseman. I think his numbers were a little bit pumped up by the significant power play time he had. I kind of like Kulikov. I think Oposo is a good addition for them. I'm still quite bitter he left the Islanders. And... Yeah, I just think in general that on the ice, this is a good team. Ryan O'Reilly is a great player. Uh, you know, regardless of what party your donut stands, he's crashing. <laughs> Vander Kane's a good player, regardless of what a douchebag he is off the ice. He's got to find something, though. This year. I mean, he's he's a last chance saloon guy, if ever there was one right now. Yeah, he's got the skills. He can be a 30-goal scorer, but man, he's just, it's just a dick too often. And... If he gets it going, great. I mean, the, the possibly the early caveat for them right now is that Jack Eichel got hurt in training today. And uh, at this time, as I'm talking to you on, on this Wednesday, we don't know how severe it is. It's an ankle injury, apparently. He yelled out in pain as he went down. And is that good, bad, ugly? I don't know yet. That could hurt them early, though, because, you know, it's some... One person said to me the other day, you don't win anything in the first month of the season, but you can certainly lose it. And that's very true. <laughs> and that, that might hurt the Sabres if they have to a slow start. That can just you know just destroy a season. We saw it in New Jersey a number of years ago, and I think it was uh, John McClain was coach, and they're Colvachuk and Priest saying they had a terrible start under McClain. He was can. They brought in Jack Lemaire, I think, replaced him. They had a great run through the second half, but they just couldn't make it because their start was so bad. They couldn't make up the ground. So... I think Buffalo will get better. Um, maybe they'll make it onto the bubble if Eichel isn't out for too long. I don't think they're a playoff team this year, though, and there are question marks between the pipes, which may or may not be answered. Mike Wolf, huh? my old teammate from my minor league hockey days, how long until Frederick Anderson is ruined by the Leafs and sent to the Marlies to find his form? Now, this is an interesting one because Toronto gave up a heck of a lot in the end to 
sign Frederick Anderson or acquire, should I say, Frederick Anderson? Because eventually, after all was said and done, Jonathan Bernier went to Anaheim as well. So there was picks and players and all sorts of stuff flying around, and they kind of went from a situation where they had a, a guy I consider to be a good goalie in Anderson and someone who was in need of a reboot in Bernier. And I didn't think that was a bad tandem because, sure, if Bernier falters, he's a unrestricted free agent next summer, so he's like, all right, we'll walk away. But we'll give him the chance to compete. And you've got two good goalies to split an 82-game season over. Instead, they moved him. They've gone with Anderson for, was it, $5 million a year until 2021. And they brought in Jonas Enroth as the backup. Now, I don't hate Enroth. I don't dislike Anderson. I think he's good. But at $5 million for the amount of stuff they gave up to save the Maple Leafs, no pun intended. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I think the pressure on him is going to be big. As I said, I think he is a good goalie, but this is a completely different situation to Anaheim, where there was an expectation to win because the Ducks had a good team, one capable of possibly winning a cup. Whereas in Toronto, you're in Toronto, where guys are accused of eating too many hot dogs, even though they're you know 40 goal capable scorers. So it'd be interesting to see how he takes to that. He may be fine. He's a pretty relaxed guy by all accounts. And uh, the pressure's on, though. I mean, as I say, he's, he's under contract till 2021. It's a um, hefty amount, I think, for a goalie of his ability. Uh, you know, if he walks the walk, good for him. If he doesn't, he, that could get real ugly real quick, and there ain't many real dead cert options coming out. I mean, people got high on Sparks, who, you know, he looked good, but he's still learning his craft in a lot of ways. Anton Bebo as well. I don't know. I mean, this is a tough one because the Leafs, again, kind of like the Sabres, will be better this year because guys like uh, Nylander will come in and give them a boost and Kadri and Riley and, you know, Austin Matthews, obviously. It's it's a work in progress. Everybody at the Maple Leafs admits that. And it depends how patient... I think part of this, actually, it depends how patient people are willing to be. I think there's a lot of patience around the team last year because they felt like the rebuild was really properly being sorted out, done, whatever. So there was a lot more patience around the Leafs. Um, but, as I say, they've given up a lot to get Anderson. And that's a big a big gamble, really. So, uh, just one little thing I wanted to touch on before I go. Uh, Blue Jackets captain Nick Foligno donated a million dollars to two hospitals that helped treat his daughter when she had a uh, uh, heart condition. It's going to be split between hospitals in the Columbus area, $500,000 each. I thought that was a, a great thing to do. We talk about, you know, I've mentioned two douchebags in Kane and Kane. So I thought I'd better finish on a uh, a positive note with that little bit of news. Uh, just before I go then, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, thank you very much for joining me again this week. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Rob McGregor 35 Find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash short. You can email onepuckshort at gmail.com. And of course, you can find the blog onepuckshort.wordpress.com. Thank you very much again for joining me, and I'll speak to you all again very soon.